Do you like books? I mean, really, really like books? Then you're in the right place. Each week, your host, Sam Hankin, interviews the best of today's top-selling authors and the up-and-coming superstars of modern literature. This is The Avid Reader. Here is your host, Sam Hankin. Hi, everyone. Welcome to another edition of The Avid Reader, brought to you by Wellington Square Bookshop. Our guest today is Professor Mark Kuckelberg, author of Self-Improvement, Technologies of the Soul in the Age of Artificial Intelligence. And it's published by Columbia University Press. It'll be released uh, in mid-July. Mark is the Professor of Philosophy of Media and Technology at the University of Vienna. He's written many books about robotics, the ethics of same, but the two that mesh nicely with the new work are AI Ethics, an introduction to the philosophy of technology. He's the former president of the Society for Philosophy and Technology, by the way. Have right. we been so obsessed with self-improvement that this $11 billion industry has become toxic in that the obsession has led to an actual turning away from the self and embracing outside encouragement, apology, and excuse and kind of almost in an egotistical way, which is not the way you want to go. Like the ancient philosophers that uh, Professor talks about in the book, Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, and more modern ones, Nietzsche, Wittgenstein, and others advise, let's just take a close look at ourselves. And as Socrates suggested, know thyself. Not navel-gazing, but an effort to understand what drives us, how mora morality, and in this case, technology, can create a fine template for epistemological and metaphysical inner knowledge, not necessarily the seat of human consciousness and the possibility, as I know and, and he knows, uh, that with quantum computers, even this week, they've come up with something that theoretically is 180 million times faster than the fastest supercomputer. So it's not the idea that a quantum computer could simulate the entire universe like a Turing machine, but a more prosaic, if you will, approach to the individual, that individual being you. So welcome, Mark, and thanks so much for joining us today. Thanks for inviting me. So I guess we should get some definitions down before we start. And the best way to do that, I think, is by parsing, you know, deconstructing the title and the subtitle of the book. So people have an idea, but what is self-improvement? What is the obsession? And what's wrong with, say, uh, Losing weight, stopping smoking, getting a better job. What's wrong with those aspects of self-improvement? And, and, and what's the other aspect you're talking about that may be problematic? Yeah, yeah. yeah self-improvement is, is an idea that, that's ancient, um, as you already suggested. And um, I think it's, it's in itself a very good idea. Um, it's, it's about, for example, the ancients recommended to... Um, to have more self-discipline, self-control. Um, nowadays, we indeed try to live more healthy. We try to improve our relationships to others and so on. And I think that's, that's in principle, a very good thing. Um, I think what, what I take issue with in the book is the, the, the obsessive character of it, the, the culture that forces us to improve ourselves, uh, culture also that, that focuses on that self on the ego um, rather than having a more relational uh, view of the self. Um, it's a culture also that's, that's highly commercialized. So, um, you know, it's good to improve yourself, but, but if that means that you can only improve yourself if you buy products X, Y, Z, if you um, buy these services, if you watch these movies and so on, then, then we get into a very different kind of atmosphere. And I think that that's the atmosphere we're in now, that, that people are obsessively busy with it. They are buying all kinds of stuff and, and believe that it improves their lives. Um, but in fact, it can lead to the opposite. It can lead to less well-being and flourishing um, once it gets so obsessive and once it gets so much focused on the self as opposed to relating to others. Okay, well then that's a good lead into the second half of the title, which is what's gonna be intriguing and perhaps confusing, which is good. As a bookseller, that's a good title because it says, you know, oh, this looks interesting. Um, so the idea is then how in the world does technology and the soul, two seemingly disparate things, how does technology and the soul 
interface with the idea of creating a, for one of a better word, a better you. Exactly. Yeah. Um, um, let me start with technology. I think we we use technologies nowadays to improve ourselves. Like um, we try to do it by social media. We try to do it by tracking ourselves with all kind of apps. For example, when we sport, um, we we keep our you know food um, uh, patterns. We we uh, we quantify ourselves by means of all these technologies. Um, and, and that can lead to a very particular way of looking at humans, um, looking at humans and ourselves um, as this like collection of data, as data producers, um, as as you know, bunch of, of quantified quantified data. Um, so that I'm critical about that. And um, interestingly, uh, technologies are also sometimes used for uh, spiritual purposes. Um, instead of doing years of 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 training for example um buddhist meditation um or or similar um uh, you know people want want fast track enlightenment uh people want spiritual progress uh but they want to be want to have it fast and they use technologies for that um and with with new neurotechnologies with all kind of techniques that use also ai um, we, we, we can actually try to get in different brain states um, and, and try to reach what normally uh, takes years. Um, of course, I'm also critical of that. Of that I think it's, um, it's, it's, again, a sort of consumption way of looking at religion in this case or at, um, at reaching different levels of consciousness, uh, reaching enlightenment. Um, so, but but I'm, I'm interested in what happens there, how, you know, wh how and why do people use this? Um, what do they want to reach with it? Um, how do they fail with it? Um, and um, in, in what kind of culture does that fit, right? In, in this culture of techno-solutionism where we always think that for every problem there should be a technological fix um rather than also looking at other solutions and at maybe slower but um more uh, beneficial um ways uh, both for ourselves and others to to reach um uh, these goals it's funny when you mentioned buddhism i think of the concept of spiritual materialism which is kind of what you're talking about and the interesting thing about the bookstore is you know i have my self-improvement section and i don't really like it but then you also say, you know, like the apps we use, the workshops we go to, the speakers, motivational or otherwise, retreats, yeah. silent meditation, which harkens back actually to your monastery stuff, but mm. and life hacks. And I hate the word hacks. Um, right. So should everyone just give up all those things? What, what you know, should they not go see whatever his name is, Tony Robbins, you know, that kind of thing? Mm. I, I think there's, you know, people should not give up improving themselves, um, but I think they should see the limitations of using that kind of method. So, um, you know, if 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 what you want to do is buy that book, uh, go to that workshop, watch watch a video um, of these people, then by all means do it. But I think it's good to realize that um, these kind of methods. Um, do not necessarily change your whole life and we also require a lot of hard work for, um, from yourself like you know with your mind uh, with your body and um won't do the trick as um as fast as as a consumer product is supposed to do or as fast as a click on on a website is is supposed to do um so so i think it's about maybe uh, finding some more moderation with that kind of products and services and maybe maybe shifting focus right from from trying to find that quick solution to um to really going you know embarking on a longer journey of improving yourself um which which is slower and and you know perhaps um will lead to a lot of failures and um will also involve yeah a, a, view, a more open view a view that's less self-focused but it's more about 
you know, not maybe not the main, maybe the main goal shouldn't be self improvement, but but you know, improvement um, of others or improvement of 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 the world around you, uh, which might bring self improvement on the way. Um, so we should think about that. I'm, I, I don't have the magic solution either there, but I think we we should see the limitations of this um, obsessive focus with, with with the self and and using this technological and commercial means as the only uh, and quick fix. Well, so, you know, when you, it's really great the way you bring in all the philosophers that people have some, some readers will be very conversant, some readers will just be learning and it'll be good because then they'll go, as I have for some of the philosophers like Lovelock, he's not really a philosopher but looking i didn't know who he was and then looking him up and learning a lot more about it which was really good but if you go back to socrates you know the idea of know thyself and then whoever said the unexamined life is not worth living okay i guess a cynic might say well what good does that do you know thyself what what, what good do, how does that go towards improvement because you seem to like the idea mm. i do like the idea um i do think that um that of course examining one's life and philosophical reflection um is not the only thing we should do we should also care about our body our about our health and so on uh we should not only engage in in uh, sort of cognitive stuff um but i think what what um socrates got right is that um yeah we, we it's it's worth reflecting on your own life, on what you really want, on um, on how you can improve um, your 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 life, um, and uh, yeah, f philosophy offers offers ways to do that. Offers also some um, some ideas to do that, um, but it's not like you know you you can summarize this in a few one-liners or. Or build that into a product, and then then all is done. It's actually um, a kind of lifelong, um, difficult process um, where you slowly get to know yourself, um, and get to know yourself also through others, uh, through your interactions with the world. Um, and and I think what's wrong with many uh, self improvement products and services now is that. Yeah, that that they kind of pretend that you can, so to speak, take take a you know a blue pill or a red pill or whatever it is, and 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 things are you know done for you, uh, or or things go very fast, and 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 that's simply not not the case. Well, now we have this helper AI, and I wouldn't bring up robotics necessarily, but that's part of your expertise and. You read about philosophy of robotics, ethics of robotics, which reminds me of Isaac Asimov and the three laws of robotics, which is don't hire them any human being, follow instructions, and uh, make sure you, you stay intact. But there's this zeroth law, which is, as you said, protect mankind. Don't let anything bad happen to mankind, like the Gaia prop. You talk about that, the Gaia. So I guess that would be, if you're truly enlightened, I don't know, would the sole mission of your life be simply to protect and enhance and preserve, as you suggest in your closing, um, mankind? You know, you know, you can talk about utilitarianism and Hume and uh, Bentham and John Stuart Mill, but is part of your, your thesis that perhaps we should look more at preserving our own society and the earth itself? Mm. Yeah, I think it's good to um, see ourselves as relational, also in the sense that we are living on this planet and connected to all these ecosystems, um, and 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 we are part of uh, humankind. So I think it's 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 a good goal to try to contribute to improving things, also for for the bigger whole. It's a good thing to um, to relate to the to the to to the larger um context we're part of now the problem with utilitarianism is that it can become um a more sort of alienated abstract way of relating to the world where you're kind of you know again 
um, have a kind of recipe um, that as a philosopher king, as a, as a you know, kind of almost authoritarian person want to impose on the world, say like, you know, uh, Im, 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 improve mankind, improve humankind, but, but you know, forget about um, individual beings. Um, so th th there are people who think about the future of humanity in those terms. There are people who think that we should prioritize the, um, you know, hypothetical lives of, of future generations in such a way that that lives today don't count so much, for example. So it, it's it's a kind of dangerous um, thing, I think, to to think only about the whole. Um, but but what is good, I think, is to see ourselves as as part of the whole, see ourselves as as part of of society, of communities, um, and and indeed of the the living uh, ecosystems of this planet. Um, and so I think it is good to Im improve those things. Also, I have that as a goal um, because that the improvement of ourselves, I think, is intrinsically connected to improving. Um, our environment, our ecological environment, our um, also even the political environment, um, so that that we you know increase human flourishing, but in in a way that starts with that more relational and engaged way um, of of relating to the outside world, um, rather than you know thinking that as a philosopher with one formula you can improve the world and and um, and 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 that's it you know one of the, the things that's helpful for you and everybody else is that and you bring it out very clearly in the book is that um, you know we stand on the shoulders of these giants like aristotle and wittgenstein and you know it gives you it gives you mixing metaphors it gives you a leg up um but but then you know for our readers and if we have this in the nonfiction book club they will argue back and forth because, for example, Wittgenstein, the world is what we make of it. And then you go, well, language, is, language is technology and techn technology is language. It's like kind of solipsistic. And then, so that, that's going to confuse the reader because he's going to think, wait a minute, you're talking about actually rolling your sleeves up like mine are and working. And then you're talking about, wait a minute how do I even know that reality exists? It's almost solipsistic. And so you're talking about the concept of improving in conjunction with technology, but then you're also talking about something that people can't really get a handle on. If language is technology and technology is language and you can't separate subject from object, that's mm. really confusing. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it, it can be confusing. And I think that that Wittgenstein there, the way that you talked about uh, his ideas can be, can be taken in a in a sort of Cartesian solipsistic way um, that we we focus on ourselves and doubt the world around us. Um, I, I think that's not the way it should be read. I think um, that that I mean from from Wittgenstein and other philosophers of language, we can really learn how important language is in in shaping the world. Um, and and that's really you know a significant breakthrough in in philosophy. Um, but for me, that language, which is indeed a technology, is like all technologies, is, is related to humans and it's related to, to the world. Um, maybe there is not um, a sort of one-to-one -one representation of the world in language. Language is indeed, you know, that is much more active. It's much more constructing that world also. Um, but but it's part of a, a wider process and humans are are part of the process and and other elements are part of that. So um, I see technologies uh, and humans as as part of this more ecological and processual world um, where things are changing and where where language influences the world, but the world also um, yeah is 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 related to that language. Um, so. Yeah, I, th I think we, you know, this is a huge topic, but um, yeah, for me, language as a technology means also to to um, embed language um, in the world and to, to see how it shapes the world. I was just thinking while you're talking about that, and maybe you can tell from my questions, 
perhaps learning to think before you speak might be a really good way of self-improvement. And it's true, AI is able to do that. Human beings have a very, I have a very difficult time of actually processing information before they spout out some nonsense, which you get into to a certain extent in the socioeconomic aspect, the, politi the political aspect of the world today and how absurd and evil and nasty it is. But yeah, it's true. I hadn't thought about it that way before, but I think if you could process, evaluate before you actually provided information to the world in the form of language, that might be a form of self-improvement. Yeah, I mean, I think we can learn from from philosophy uh, to indeed think before before we speak. Um, and and in this world, that's that's not really um, always appreciated, right? One has to be quick. One has to perform. Um, and those who cannot perform on the spot, those who fail to you know spit out words immediately, um, are often disregarded or. Um, uh, you know, are are are, are neglected even. Um, I think that this world is a is a world that's um, that that's that often benefits um, uh, people who are extrovert, people who are who are ready to perform without thinking too much. And uh, I, th I think philosophers um, teach that that it's good to to argue, to reason, to um, to discuss things and. Um, yeah, I think that they help us to lead better lives in that way. Um, I also think they can help us to lead better, to 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 shape better relationship with others, um, because instead of immediately reacting to someone, um, for example, in a in a you know in a way that that shows negative emotions, um, it encourages us to be these reflective beings and and um, think about things, also put ourselves in the in a place of someone else. Um, philosophers, normally if if you know if you do it well, philosophy, you you learn to also see the arguments of other people, to even think up the arguments of other people. Um, so you can better shape your own view. Um, I, I think those are skills that are generally very, very helpful to humanity. Um, and and I think philosophy, you know, used to be regarded as something that yeah, was not, not not very useful, not very relevant. Uh, but but in fact, the contrary is the case. I think, and we I think we need philosophy and humanities today um, to make to help to make sense of the world and to also uh, indeed improve things. Uh, but it's not the improvement that you know comes with. You know, quickly reading one book or, or or a few quotes from from famous philosophers. It's 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 also a process that takes time. Yeah, I think your last line in the book, I think, is you know something like we need technologies that uh, tell different and better stories about ourselves, and and better selves will then emerge. But the problem I see with it is like, for example, American politics and one politician in particular. Mm -hmm. When he speaks, he's speaking, spouting nonsense. There's no, nothing empirical about it. There's no epistemological aspect of his speech. Mm -hmm. Yet, half of Americans follow him as sheep. And mm -hmm. so, yeah, you're saying we need technology. How in God's name am I supposed to, what is my involvement supposed to be? Are other Americans, or in, in right-wing countries like Greece that just had a selection? How are we supposed to do what you want to, you're saying academically, you tell me what the process would be to move towards a goal like that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think this, what the, the things you're talking about are very worrying, very concerning. And um, I'm currently writing on AI and democracy, um, you know, because I'm so worried about this kind of, uh, you know, partly because I'm worried about this kind of phenomena. I think the, the for me, the magic word there is, um, is education. Um, now it's, it's easily said and it's not so easy to spell out exactly what we need, um, but something like an education where you learn the kind of critical skills that, that philosophers have, um, 
where, where you learn to to question the evidence, to question the facts, um, where you learn to to deal with text, uh, for example, from ChatGPT, um, or indeed learn to deal with with the words that are um, almost thrown up by some of these politicians. I I, I think th that is something that we can we can teach people. We can learn to do better uh, on that um, so we need some kind of citizen education civic education um, and th that's that's an old idea also again from ancient times has been taken up in the renaissance and then later developed also by enlightenment philosophers um, until in, in you know 20th century um, in in the american context john dewey i think um, developed some very interesting ideas about that. So I, I think the, the intellectual heritage is there to do something about education, um, whether it's political, politically feasible to really radically improve our education and build in that civic and you know civilizing element also um, is another question. But I think that's the sort of direction we need to move. Um, and, and I would really wish my American friends to, to go move more in that direction. Yeah, it's like kind of talking about Pico and his 900 theses, and that's what chat GP, he wanted to be chat GPT. So like, yep. Right. But what I was saying in the introduction, look how fast it's moving. You know, you go, everyone in the world knows chat GPT. Six months ago, no one knew what it was. Then it was 3.5, now it's 4.0. It stopped in September of 2021. This other one, Inflection, Pi it goes current because it's actually connected to the internet, which ChatGPT isn't. So, how do you think the the ancients would feel about having access to essentially all the knowledge they needed to to have mm. in order to live their lives? I mean, I asked ChatGPT about you, and I got mm. a pretty good summary, which helped me in my research. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think this kind of technologies should not be banned or anything. I think I think we should use them, uh, make good use of them, uh, but but we should also be aware of the limitations, uh, the possibility, for example, that they suddenly come up with with complete nonsense. Um, so sh we should really have exercise these kind of digital skills, kind of you know develop a kind of digital humanism where we are. You know, not only looking at, at at books in a critical way and learning to deal with that, learning to read in a critical way, but where we also learn to deal with technologies and media of today, uh, you know, as 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 great tools, tools also to connect people and and to have intellectual uh, conversations, but also tools that are not perfect and and uh, and yeah, you know, epistemic environments that are polluted by by people who on purpose spread misinformation uh, and nonsense, but, al but also, you know, quite naturally, uh, you know, th there will be always noise, there will be always um, information that that's not correct. So I think we, we need to also learn to deal with that. Um, we, we can try to improve the technologies, but we also need that education to, you know, deal with it in a, in a, in a critical way. Um, and and I'm not against technology at all. I think we should absolutely reap the benefits of them. Um, uh, usually, the um, you know, emphasis is then on on economic gain. I think we should especially reap the benefits in terms of human well-being and flourishing. Um, I think they can contribute to better lives, um, but we should develop that that critical attitude um, because otherwise we we will be. Uh, and are just victim of um, people who use the technologies for these bad purposes, but also for we are victims of the you know all the unintended um, bad effects of every medium and technology that comes to us. Um, and and I think one start for that um, is to realize that technologies are not neutral, that media are not this just these tools. Um, but that with those media and, and, and tools come ways of seeing the world, ways of perceiving the world, uh, ways of seeing it ourselves and others. And I think once we realize that, that they're also, you know, human and cultural and um, for, you know, ethically and politically loaded, um, 
then, then we can begin to to have a discussion about like what kind of technology and media do we want? What kind of role do we want? Um, and what kind of role can can this particular technology play in that? Well, you said you were worried. I'm naturally, for good or for bad, a pessimist. And I see things moving so quickly. And then, you know, if you look at the letter that was signed by all the AI people, let me ask you this, like bluntly, would you be, would you have signed that letter had you been asked, given your expertise? I didn't uh, sign that letter that asked for a, for a break. Um, yeah. I, I, I think it was a letter that was um, created by by a very specific group of people who have specific ideas about the the future of humanity, um, and and also people who have vested interest in um, in perhaps having some confusion about these technologies, but who at the same time very much invest in them. Um, I think this was a very political kind of move and. Um, what we need instead of this um, kind of big fears and doom thinking um, is, is to rather look at the very specific ethical issues and, and political challenges that come with these technologies um, and, and not ban them or, or pause innovation, but, but rather think about how can we um, regulate these technologies in a way that, um, that shapes the innovation in a good way that also um, yeah, is, is, is more democratic because what we now have is that um, our our technological future and therefore the society society's future future of our societies is really um, determined by by a, a few uh, CEOs and owners of big tech companies, and I think that that's something that, a situation that we you know. Um, you know, we all respect for the need for entrepreneurship. I think it's a situation that we cannot um, tolerate in a democratic society. So we need to do something about that. Um, and you're also very right about the the, the speed of developments. Um, in in uh, 2018, I was part of this high-level expert group that advised the European Commission on AI, uh, regulating AI. Uh, only next year we will really have the implementation of um, of the, the the legal framework that that came out of that. I, I I think this is going far too slow, and this is you know at the moment the fastest um, process we we had is the first big big uh, robust legislation. So um, I think we need to do something also about that. We need to, as a society, be able to react faster to the uh, fast um, technological changes. Um, think maybe about new institutions that can can react faster, um, because speed is a problem, is a big challenge, and and we need to tackle that. Yeah, and for those who aren't familiar with your previous work, it's 2019, which in technology seems like a century ago now. Um, really does. 2019, you wrote AI ethics, so that's what we're talking about is ethics. So for those who don't know. What was the central theme then, and would it be the same now, of the ethical implications of AI? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would say back then, uh, there has been a lot of emphasis on developing trustworthy AI, and trustworthy AI was basically a synonym for ethical AI. And, and ethical AI was, the idea was that humans stay in control and that um, that humans are responsible for for AI, and that that's still, of course, a concern today. Um, but I think with the new developments, um, ChatGPT, also before the, you know, uh, suddenly AI can create art uh, and things like that. I think what we what we realize now is that that um, the impact on on society is much bigger than many people thought. Um, and I think that we will move in directions where, yeah, where, where people start understanding that these technologies um, are indeed quite invasive and quite, um, you know, quite a lot changing our world. Um, and I think before AI was still, you know, it was, a, it was already hyped a bit, but it wasn't, I think you know the general public wasn't really uh, aware so much of the uh, of the risks and the uh, the challenges. I think now that's just changing, 
and I think it's an opportunity to to think together about like how you know how are we going to deal now with AI? What the next thing will come in a few years? Um, what, how are we going to deal with new technologies in our society? It's a, it's a question people like me think about already for for 20, 25 years. But but I think it's um, it, it's now a question that's more imminent, that's that's more pertinent for for today. Um, so I, I hope that um, you know that these developments also lead to to positive change in that direction that that we um, create better ways of dealing with with new and emerging technologies. Yeah, well, kind of going back to Asimov's rules of robotics, the idea is to me AI, like you know, whether it's Elon Musk saying it's a more pressing problem than climate change or nuclear. Well, let's talk about nuclear weapons. No one's used them since we use them, but they still scare everybody. Right now, what you're suggesting, I think, is you know that we continue to protect ourselves with algorithms and AI that preclude it, that preclude AI from harming us. But once someone, some bad actor gets a hold of the technology, he can easily take that fail-safe mechanism off. And mm -hmm. that's what scares me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think there, there, there are risks in that sense, but we, we shouldn't think too much about AI. You know, th there are cybersecurity risks. There are, of course, also military uses and so on. But, but I think the the AI we should worried about today mainly is the AI that we don't always see. The AI that's that's behind the screen. That you know, when we use. Uh, internet and, and digital social media. Um, th there are search engines that are like we are being profiled, our data are analyzed and so on. I think this kind of AI um, is potentially very dangerous because it can be used to, to manipulate people for both political purposes and for commercial purposes. And we have to watch out that we don't move to a society where we are, you know, um, profiled and treated like lab rats and, and um, manipulated and experimented with in, in that sense. Um, because that undermines, I think, the, the ideals that we, we inherited from the Enlightenment, for example. Um, you know, we, we want to be autonomous beings. We want to be, um, you know, having some control and some say over our lives, over what we, what we think and believe over what we feel and so on. And I think we, the possibilities of AI are now such that, um, yeah, we, we, we can be very easily manipulated by our thoughts and feelings. Um, and th that's going to be a big issue, I think, in the, in the coming years. Um, and then I find that the, you know, the issues about um, yeah, who gets hold of the technology to do what, I, th I think that's that's probably not um, not the most uh, important risk. It's funny that when you like you, when you go back to the philosophers, which is a really fascinating aspect of the book. So you're talking about Sartre and free. You were just talking about freedom. You know, Sartre's mm -hmm. kind of saying freedom is like really scary. Freedom is a really scary thing to have. It may be the scariest thing to have. And mm -hmm. so there's a paradox in your in what you're saying. Absolutely, I think it's a, it's a huge problem, and I I dealt with it a little bit in my book, um, the um, called Green Leviathan, where where I, um, I I bring up this scenario, like what if there is this um, sort of benign dictator who, for the good of humanity, takes away the freedom, and and uh, argues that we should use AI to um, to govern humanity. Uh, for the benefit of humanity, and of course, I'm 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 critical of that. I, I it, it's also kind of utilitarian reasoning. It's a kind of um, yeah, it's an authoritarian use of AI, of course. So we don't want that. Um, but the reason why I use the example, um, and I go back to to Dostoevsky, to the Brothers Karamazov, where there's the the Grand Inquisitor making a similar argument, like people are you know don't want freedom, so let's Let's rule them. Um, 
I I think this kind of we we should take serious the you know the temptation in a way and, and the challenge because uh, the more AI gets powerful and better uh, in in what it does, um, the more there will be the, the temptation of of you know the powerful people in the world, powerful co corporations, powerful governments to to use this uh, tool to um, you know to to try to improve us to come back to improvement uh, in in the name of you know uh, doing good in in the name of of, of improving people so so I, yeah I, th I think that's that's something that um, we should be aware of that this is a is a danger and because it goes against our fundamental values and and and, and human rights and um, yeah it's it's I think it's a direction we should by all means uh, avoid um, uh, while recognizing that you know some influencing of of the choices people make is probably needed in the light of climate change, in the light of uh, dealing with 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 um, a lot of problems in this world. Um, but that that's a different, difficult problem, a difficult challenge, I think. Um, once once AI uh, enables all these these possibilities, it harkens almost all the way back to Plato's Republic. You know, that's right. That's right. Uh, Plato argued that we uh, we should have the guardians that are you know that know what to do that know what is good for us, um, and and that we should give them the the, the, the steering wheel. Well, um, I think that that that's not what we want, but we should we should really think about um, what we want instead. Uh, that that's in the the, the upcoming book. That's uh, the about. question, right? Yeah. I was ask you. Well, first of all, you're up. You I think it boils down to you're optimistic and I'm pessimistic. But right. as we as we close, and that was a good segue to it, is talk a little bit about what this coming work is, and then we can sign off. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I I, I am working on on uh, you know the question about AI and democracy. Like, what is AI doing to democracy? And I see all kind of risks there. Um, but but I also use it as an opportunity to ask the question like okay what well, you know what what is democracy then um, what kind of democracy do we want do we want a, a system where um, you know people just vote every so many years which we have now and and vote for you know the most um, you know, uh, silly person that there is. Um, uh, <laughs> is that democracy, right? Or, or do we want something else? Um, and so that takes me on a journey about democracy. And then, uh, you know, like just a self-improvement is not just about technology, but about what what is that self then and, and what is a, what is improvement of that self? Um, the, I ask the question, what kind of democracy do we want? What 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 is a good kind of politics? Um, and yeah, I, th I think this, um, you know, that that's the beauty, I think, also about the, these debates um, that are about technology is that that it brings up the the, the big uh, often ancient philosophical questions, uh, which are not only interesting academically, but we, which are just simply uh, the big questions for us as persons and as societies. And that's what I'm interested in. And that's what I think philosophers can contribute a little bit uh, to. So um, I'll keep writing those books. Yeah, I think it's it's great that you're writing them. I wouldn't want to undertake it because you're going to have to be writing until the day that the book comes out because everything actually is moving that fast. You know? Oh, yeah, that's a problem. <laughs> <laughs> it's the problem. Yeah. Well, sure, actually printing the pages and get well look your book isn't even out yet you got a month to go or three weeks to exactly go. and in the meantime lots of things happen people say things about democracy and so on yeah it's a it's a it's a it's always a little bit behind in that sense but it also provides some stability of course right so um i try to write them in a way that they can still be used in in a couple of years yeah and you have um well thank you so much it was a pleasure talking to you today about your book and um, uh, I look forward to it coming out and having it in the bookshop. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure to talk. Likewise. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.